Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So good morning. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay. Maybe I don't even need this, but I'll try it, and if it gets irritating, just let me know. So I joined the novitiate, the seminary for the Legionaries of Christ, in September of 2000, September 14, 2000. And I remember they took us to the cubicles that we were going to live in for the next two years. Each of us had our own cubicle, nicely furbished with a bed and a little dresser, and that was it. And I remember hanging up there, there was a black cassock. So cassock is the black robe that priests used to wear, that we still wear when we're in the house. We don't wear it too much out of the house, but we wear it in the house. And then a black sash, so like a black band, like a band of cloth with a safety pin stuck in it, and then a white collar. And I knew I was supposed to wear them, but I didn't know what they were for. I didn't know what the purpose was. And the next day they explained, okay, so the black cassock, this black sack basically, is a sign of the vow of poverty that Christ is going to be your only treasure. And then the white collar is a sign of the vow of chastity, that you're called to love in the same way that Christ loved in this world. And then the black sash with the safety pin to hold it up is a sign of obedience. Like it's wrapped around your waist, so it's kind of a, supposed to be a sign that you've yoked yourself to Christ and that his will is your will, that God's will is your will now, that you've totally given up your own will to the will of the Father. And when I understood what those things were for, when I understood what their purpose was, I knew why I was wearing them. Purpose is identity. We could really say that purpose is identity for us. If we understand the purpose, we understand identity. So why do we exist? What am I created for? What are you created for? And we all have different vocations. We all have different callings in life. But is there one core purpose, you could say, that we all share? What is it? The Catechism of the Catholic Church gives us that answer in the very first number. So that was just a little teaser. We'll get to that in a minute. But first, I want to go through, very quickly, just through, remind us of the vision for the Regnum Christi Women's Section here in Philadelphia. It's a vibrant section filled with women of faith who love and live like Christ, have a burning desire to be a passionate apostle, look to the Blessed Mother for her intercession to help us fulfill our mission in the church as wives, mothers, and beloved daughters of Christ. Yeah. There are a few questions that Stephanie has always proposed. Did we work like Jesus? Did we reveal Christ's love? Did we form apostles? Did we launch them in their God-given mission? Did we awaken the individual and the family to their mission in life and in the church? In order to do that, we need formation. Formation is one of the pillars in Regnum Christi. But I think it's important to understand, what do we mean when we say formation? St. John Paul II gives us, I think, the best explanation of formation. He said formation is transformation into Christ. Formation is actually transformation into Christ. It's almost like, imagine a flower. Like, you have this kind of wilted rose, maybe, and you start giving it miracle grow. And it starts to change, or it starts to flourish, hopefully. It starts to blossom and become what it's supposed to be, and it becomes something very, very beautiful, but it takes time. In the same way, formation is actually the lifelong process that we have of transformation into Christ. And Christ, through the Holy Spirit, does all the heavy lifting. He's the one who actually transforms us, but we have to show up. That's all he asks us, is just to show up. So one of the ways... I'm not going to read all these now. We're going to send these, these slides around so you can read these, what we understand by formation. But that's the core of it, is that transformation into Christ. And these are just some different ways that Regnum Christi offers to do that, individually, as a team, as a section, and then as a territory. So this would be like, as a section, one of the ways that we're invited to undergo that transformation into Christ. So that's why we're doing this whole series. And let's get back to that earlier question. Is there one thing that we're all created for? 
one thing that we all share, no matter what our vocation is, no matter what our struggles are, no matter what our gifts are, is one thing that we're all created for. Catechism tells us God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. He freely created man, all of us, to make us share in his own blessed life. That's why we're created. It's pretty awesome. And what is God's own blessed life? We know that God is love. That's what the Bible tells us. God is love. If you want to understand blessed Trinity, I think the best image comes from St. Augustine. St. Augustine said, imagine that you have our own experience of human love, and that can tell us something about God. So whenever you really love somebody, you have a lover, you have a beloved, and then you have the love between them, which is so powerful that it can be like a third person, right, or a third reality. The lover, beloved, and then the love between them. So he said the Father in the Trinity is the lover. The Son is like the beloved, and the Holy Spirit is like the love between them, which is so powerful that it, it's a third person. Keep this in mind, because when we talk later about everything to do with marriage, hopefully this sounds familiar, lover, beloved, and the love between them, which is a third person. So it's an image of God in the family. But God is love. So it's this constant dynamic of giving and receiving love in the Blessed Trinity. That's the life that we're called into. When it says that God wants us to share his own blessed life, that's what it means. We're called into this dynamic of love, of infinite, incredible love. So that's why we decided to call this series Created for Love, because we're all created for infinite love. We're created to receive God's love and to respond with our own love. We're called to love all people as God loves them. That's why we're created. And that means that, in the end, Catholicism is a great yes. It's a yes to love. If you want a simple definition of Catholicism, it's just a yes to love, to God's plan of love for the human person. And we're going to talk about some very tough topics later on in this series. I was thinking about this today, how the gospel is the good news. I think we all believe that, right? Christ came to give us the good news. But in the world that we live in today, there are many parts of that good news that we don't see as good news anymore. We think they're bad news. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we can actually give God a fair hearing? <laughs> Just to say, okay, what's your whole plan? Why do you teach what you teach us in the gospel? I think most of you are, are parents here, right? Probably everybody, I think, has children. So when you see your child walking towards the edge of a cliff, you're going to say, you know what? That's probably not the best idea. It's probably not going to help you be fully alive if you walk off the edge of that cliff. When I was a little kid, my brothers and I thought it would be awesome to take two screwdrivers and those outlets, you know, the wall, they, they, they just look great. It's a stick one in each of the holes and then you cross the, you cross the metal. When my mom saw that, I didn't know she could move that fast or kick that hard. Because <laughs> she was like, no, you can't do this. You can kill yourselves. That's what parents do. And the church is like a good mother. The church has received this gift from Christ. And she's trying to help us to be fully alive, to be fully in love, to live in love. So sometimes real love asks for a no for the sake of a greater yes. You probably know this better than I do with your kids, right? Sometimes you have to say no, but it's for the sake of a greater yes. And it's important to know what that greater yes is. So that's what we're going to be exploring. St. Edith Stein was a brilliant philosopher in Germany. She was Jewish in the 1920s and 30s. She was actually Edmund Husserl, so he's considered the father of phenomenology. He was one of the great philosophers of the 20th century. Had a huge influence on John Paul II. She was actually one of his students, but he said he learned more from her than she did from him. So that gives you a sense of her magnitude as a philosopher. She became Catholic and became a Carmelite nun. And in 1942, she was arrested by the Nazis for being Jewish and brought to Auschwitz concentration camp, where she was martyred. So she was killed there. She has a beautiful, beautiful idea that's going to really be the backbone of our entire series here. When she said, never accept something as truth if it lacks love. 
and never accept something as love if it lacks truth. So never accept something as truth if it's not loving. But never accept something as love if it's not true. What, what's her name again? Edith Stein, oh. S-T-E-I-N. Yeah. So, so Teresa Benedict of the Cross is her account. She's St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, canonized in 2000 by St. John Paul II. So in this series, we're going to have a fourfold goal. There are four goals in this. So remember when I was studying in Rome, we had a professor for some reason. He'd always say four points. Four points. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have a fourfold goal. So first of all, to explain what Christ teaches us through the church about some of these tough topics. So just first to explain what the church actually teaches us, just so we know. What does Christ teach us through the church? Second goal, to explain why Christ teaches us that through the church. Third goal is to bring all of this to prayer. And this is really, really, really important because we're going to talk about tough things. We're going to talk about things that have touched all of us in some way, probably personally, definitely personally, and then people that we know. And we're not here to judge anybody. None of us is called to be God's executioner, God's, you know, God's hatchet person. God, it's not what God wants from us. And we're all sinners here. I think we all know that, but just to make sure we all have it clear, we're all sinners. And we've all done things that have not been according to God's plan of love for the human person. If I were to tell you all the things that I've done that haven't been in accordance with that plan, we'd be here until Sunday morning. So we're all, we're all part of this. It's not like it's us versus them. But it's so important to remember. It's not like it's us on one side and them on the other side. It's just all of us together stumbling home towards the Father, right? That's what sort it of means to be a Catholic. So I would really encourage you, if there are things in here that are difficult, I don't understand this, bring it to prayer. First is bring it to prayer. Bring it to Jesus. And then like Stephanie said, by all means, I mean, reach out to Father Peter, to me, to anybody that you think might be able to explain more of this. But first, bring it to Christ in prayer. So this is just to give people things to pray about. And finally, the fourth fold goal, fourth goal is to be able to explain it to others with love and with courage. In a simple way, but to be able to explain what the church teaches and why it teaches simply with love and with courage to others. Make sense? Okay. I put this quote up from Pope Paul VI because I think it's so important as we enter into this journey here. He's the newest saint in the church. He was just canonized on October 14th. And we're going to actually dedicate one of these talks to a letter that he wrote to the whole church on human life. But he had this phrase, which I really liked in his encyclical, his letter, Ecclesiam Suam, which means his church, or Christ's church in Latin. In 1966, in this letter, Paul VI, speaking about dialogue, said, before speaking... We must take great care to listen not only to what people say, but more especially to what they have it in their hearts to say. Only then will we understand them and respect them, and even as far as possible, agree with them. I think it's so important. Whenever somebody does something or says something, whatever it is, no matter how far out in left field it might seem to be, they're looking for something with that. Ultimately, if you drill down deep enough, we're looking for love. That's what we're all looking for. And Paul VI is saying it's so important to try to see that before we say anything. What is it that they have it in their hearts to say? All right, so today we're going to be talking about relativism. And this is going to be the most academic of all the talks, so it's probably going to be the most boring. I even have my notes here and everything. So if it gets too boring, just throw something at me. And let me know. But I think it's important because it's like building any building. You have to build the foundation first. And we're not going to be able to understand the other topics unless we understand this, this foundation. How did the world get to be the way it is today? Why do we see the situation that we see around us? Remember when I was in Italy, I was talking to this guy who said he was a Catholic. And so we said, hey, where do you go to church on Sundays? And he said, Father... I'm not a fanatic. <laughs> like, what, what do you mean? He's like, I'm not a fanatic. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not a fanatic. But you know what's interesting? 
he never missed a Sunday soccer game on TV. Mm -hmm. His favorite team was La Roma, the Roman soccer team. And he never, ever, ever missed a game. So we live in what Bishop Robert Barron has called a beige world. He said it's like a beige, just kind of dull world out there. What he meant by that is that we're told, don't get passionate about the things that really, really matter. So it's okay to be passionate about the evils, but not passionate about Jesus Christ. The good thing is you can be passionate both about the eagles and Jesus Christ, but first Christ and then the eagles. Although I'm actually really convinced that Jesus is secretly a Giants fan. <laughs> we can talk about that later. Though. So another word for that beige world is moral mediocrity. You can call it moral mediocrity. So we're told strive for excellence in sports. Strive to make as much money as you can. Strive to be as beautiful as you can for as long as you can. Strive to have the right friends, the right kids. And those are all good things. But then we're told, don't, 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 don't strive to make Jesus Christ the center of your life. Don't strive to love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Don't help others to know how much he loves them. So be mediocre when it comes to the things that really matter. And there's a name for the philosophy that's behind all of that. There's a name for the thinking that's behind all of that, and it's relativism. So this talk is going to be very simple in structure. It's just going to be, first of all, what is relativism? When we say relativism, what do we mean by it? Secondly, who started it? Three would be, what are the pillars of relativism, the few pillars that we can identify? What are the outcomes of relativism? And then what does God say about it? And this will all be up here on the screen, so you don't need to write it down. But just to give you a sense of where we're going, that's where we're going. So what is relativism? In college, I was talking to a friend of a friend, and he said, I'm talking about religion, and he said, the only absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth. So actually, if you think about that, you can start to see the inherent problem of relativism right there. The only absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth. So... There is at least one absolute truth, which is that there is an absolute truth. But if you want a simple definition of relativism, that's it. The only absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth. You have your truth, I have my truth. You have what's good for you, I have what's good for me. But for the sake of clarity here, let's divide relativism into two, two very closely related branches, you could say. Knowledge relativism and moral relativism. So knowledge relativism. And again, if I get too philosophical here, just raise your hand and say, hey, you know, you're out and you're out on the planet Saturn, can you come back to Earth? But knowledge relativism, what is it? There's an ancient foundation for all rational thought. The ancient Greeks were already writing about this 500 years before the birth of Christ. It's called the principle of non-contradiction. The principle of non-contradiction. Or the PNC, if you call it the PNC, the principle of non-contradiction. And it's really, really simple. It just says it's impossible for something both to be and not to be at the same time and in the same way. Very common sense, right? It's impossible for something both to be and not to be at the same time and in the same way. So let's take, for example, a Starbucks Frappuccino. So the ingredients of a Frappuccino Honestly, I didn't know this. I had to look it up this morning on the internet. But the ingredients of a frappuccino are ice, milk, frappuccino syrup, coffee, whipped cream, vanilla syrup, and vanilla bean powder. You mix those together, you put them in a nice Starbucks cup, and you get a frappuccino. We could not, according to the principle of non-contradiction, we could not take nail polish remover and motor oil, mix them together, put them in a Starbucks cup, and call them a frappuccino. It's not a frappuccino. It's something else. Actually, it's poison. <laughs> but it's not a frappuccino. Or let's say, take this podium. So the principle of non-contradiction would say this podium here can't be both a podium and a basketball hoop at the same time and in the same way. It's just not possible. And this is all common sense. Right? We all live like this. I mean, nobody goes up to the top floor of the Empire State Building and then tries to leave by the window. We know, no, I mean, stairs are to go down. You don't go out the window from that height. We, we know this. But knowledge relativism would 
try to throw this out the window. Let's say one idea is just as good as any other idea. Nobody really lives like that because even those who would subscribe to this knowledge relativism aren't going to go walk in front of a tractor trailer coming down the highway. So they live according to some standard of truth. But in theory, they say there is no absolute truth. Every idea is as good as any other idea. So knowledge relativism throws the principle of non-contradiction out the window. Moral, well actually here's one more example that I really like. I think this is the greatest cartoon of all time. <laughs> it reminds me of me when I was a kid, actually. <laughs> I don't know if you can see this, it's the far side. So there's this sign, the Midvale School for the Gifted. And there's a door that says pull. And there's this kid trying to push the door open. So that would kind of be knowledge relativism, right? Like the principle of non-contradiction. Say if it says pull, you got to pull, but he's trying to push. <laughs> knowledge relativism ultimately leads to moral relativism. Moral relativism would say there's nothing that's always right and nothing that's always wrong. It's pretty simple. Nothing that's always right, nothing that's always wrong. Depends on your point of view. You have what's good for you, I have what's good for me. And here we need to be nuanced. Because in some cases, that's true. There's, there are many things that are morally neutral. For example, coffee. Right? So Father Peter loves coffee. Right? Every day he has a big cup of coffee. And it's good for him. I can't drink coffee. I'm allergic to it. So my hands shake. I get anxious. My, my skin breaks out. It's, it's bad for me. So what's good for Father Peter is bad for me. There are many things that are like that, that are morally neutral. It could be good for one person. It's not good for another person. But some things are not morally neutral. Some things are always good for everyone. Some things are always bad for everyone. Moral relativism would say, no, there's nothing that's always bad for everyone or always good for everyone. Since ancient times, there's been a foundational principle for moral action. By moral action, I just mean acting in the right way. There's been this principle to help guide people in that. It's very simple. It's do good and avoid evil. It doesn't get much simpler than that, right? Do good and avoid evil. But this assumes that some things are always good and some things are always bad. Some things are always good and some things are always evil. But some people would disagree. Some would say, no, there's nothing that's always good and nothing that's always evil. And that brings us to the next point, which is who started this? Obviously, relativism this idea that the only absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth is as old as humanity. Remember the book of Genesis where Satan says to Adam and Eve, did God really tell you? So it goes back to the beginning of time. But there's one thinker who, in my opinion, did more than anybody else to set the foundations for the relativism in the modern world. And that is William of Ockham. So he was a Franciscan priest he lived from about 1287 to 1347. It's interesting, if you look at the history of the church, most of the great problems in the church, the great errors, the great heresies, were started by priests in their 40s. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Father Peter, you're safe, right? <laughs> I've got a couple more years, and then I'm in the danger zone, so say a prayer for me. But he was a Franciscan priest, and he was a great philosopher, a great thinker. But there are two key ideas that he had that I wanted to share today, which I think really laid the foundation for the relativism that we see in the world today. The first one is he said, we can't know the essence of anything. We can't know the essence of anything. So we would say, I think most of us would say, if we look outside, we see all these tall green things, right? Trees. Some are maple trees. Some are oak trees. Some are beech trees, but we know that there's some treeness about them that makes them all trees. Even though they're different types of trees, there's an essence, which is treeness, or a table. So we have a tall rectangular table here made out of wood. We have a lower rectangular table made out of plastic here. We have round tables there, but there's some essence, which is their tableness, right? They're all tables. William of Ockham would say, actually, we, we don't know that. We just give them a name, because we have to name something, but we can't actually know what they truly are. He would also say the same thing about the human person. We can't really distinguish any essence of what it means to be human. 
they're just all these individual beings running around us. And we call them all human beings because we have to give them some name. But they're all just individuals. There's no essence that they have. Does that make sense? Okay, that's really, really important when we come to relativism. So that's the first key concept. We can't know the essence of anything. And can you see how that can lead into knowledge relativism very easily? We don't really know what something is. We don't know what it's for because we don't know what it is. So one idea is just as good as any other idea. The second key idea that he had about moral relativism is that freedom, this is his quote, freedom is the ability to choose between opposites without restraint. So let's unpack that, because this is so important. God made us free, and he made us free for a reason. He made us free so that we could love. If we're not free, we can't love. God doesn't want puppets. He wants lovers. That's why he created us free, so that we can love. So that means that our freedom is not freedom from something. It's freedom for something. He created us free for love. Have any of you seen that movie, The Quiet Place? Yeah, yeah. It's an incredible movie. One of the five or six greatest movies ever, I think. It's kind of suspenseful, but it is, it's an amazing movie. And in the movie, you have a mom and a dad who are in this situation that is absolutely horrible. And they're called to continually sacrifice themselves for the sake of their children. And what struck me about the movie was it would have been really easy for them just, to, right, this is just way too tough. Let's just give up. Let's abandon the kids. But they chose <laughs> it's a laugh over there. They, they chose not to. They were free not from their kids. They were free for their kids. That's why God made them free, was to be able to love. William of Ockham would have said no. He said freedom is actually to be free from any constraints so that we can choose whatever we want, whenever we want. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. And he said, above all, there are no moral absolutes because of that. There's nothing that's always right or always wrong. Because it just depends on what I want to choose. Me choosing it makes it right. So if I choose something, because I choose it, it's right. That's the essence of freedom. And he would say, above all, this is where it's really scary, above all, it's true for God. So today, God could say that murder is bad. Tomorrow, God could say that murder is good. And they're both fine, because he's God. He can choose whatever he wants. Or today God could say that adultery is good, tomorrow he could say adultery is bad. And that's true, because God is free to choose whatever he wants. He even went so far as to say that somebody could try to love God for his or her whole life. Love God, serve God. At the end of the person's life, God could say, you know what, buddy, you know, nice try, but I'm sending you to hell anyway, just because. Just because I feel like it. And that would be just, that would be okay for God to do that. So you can imagine what these ideas did over time, over the course of the next few centuries. God started to become a tyrant. Instead of a loving father, God is a tyrant who's fighting with us because his absolute freedom to choose whatever he wants is conflicting with our absolute freedom to choose whatever we want. And so we've got to get rid of him. That's the only way, really. That's the, the solution. And so in the 19th century, we won't get into this now, but... That'd be an interesting discussion. You have some philosophers who would actually say, okay, we have to get rid of God. You know, Nietzsche's famous God is dead. That's what that is at the core. It's just saying, there can't be two gods in this universe. And so it's either me or the big guy up in the sky, and he's got to go. Instead of a path to joy and love, the church's teaching became seen as a straitjacket. Something that's keeping me from being happy. This is keeping me from choosing whatever I want, whenever I want. It became seen as an obligation in a negative way. When we say the word obligation today, our hackles raise, right? We don't want obligation. No, we don't want obligation because it seems like that's constricting our freedom. But you know what the word obligation actually means in Latin? This is really cool. So it comes from two Latin words, all but and ligare, so O-B and then L-I-G-A-R-E. It actually means to unite, or in a sense to, to bind two things together. So it's actually a relationship. When we talk about moral obligation, it's actually uniting us, linking us. 
like the obligation that husbands and wives have, or the obligation that parents have to their children. It's actually, it's a link. It's not a straitjacket. It's a link uniting two people. I don't mean to beat up and William of Ockham here either. I mean, who knows what his intentions were? They might have been very good intentions. And he did see something important, which is that God is free. God is supremely free. God's a mystery, right? We can't control God. We all know that. But God has revealed who he is in the Bible and in his son Jesus. He's shown us who he is, and he's love. So God is not free to be arbitrary, because God is love. He's bound by his own nature, which is love. So love is who he is. And our own freedom is actually most fully alive the more that we're like God, the more that we're living in that love. That's when we're truly free. Free for love, not free from. Okay, so what are the pillars of relativism? We've seen what it is. We talked about knowledge and moral relativism. We've seen who started it, William of Ockham. What are the pillars of relativism? These are just a few pillars, but I think these are four of the most important ones. The first one is what I mentioned at the beginning. The only absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth. The only absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth. Secondly, you have your truth, I have my truth. You have your truth, I have my truth. And the assumption is, of course, that they're both equally valid. You have your truth, I have my truth. The third, I create my own reality. I create my own reality. And then the fourth, I decide what is good and what is evil. I'm the one who decides what's good and what's evil. Okay, what are some of the outcomes of relativism? One is, I would say tolerance has replaced love as the greatest good. And by tolerance, I mean basically indifference. Because think about what we tolerate. You know, we tolerate mosquitoes, we tolerate undercooked asparagus, and things like that. But we're not called to tolerate people, we're called to love people. And that's a, a really important distinction. And I think that this indifference is sort of like, okay, I mean, you do whatever you want, I do whatever I want. As long as you don't bother me, I really don't care what you do with your life. That is, that's indifference. That's replacing love. And I think that's one of the outcomes that we can see from relativism in the world today, is that that's total indifference. The next one is uncertainty. Okay, I'm not really sure what, what is good and what is evil, what's true and what's not true. I think that relativism can lead to that, that uncertainty. And here's important also to recognize that we're not saying that we're going to be 100% certain about everything all the time. But we are saying that we really can know the truth, and God has revealed it to us in his goodness. Then you have, well, actually, on this point of uncertainty, there's something I wanted to share. I think I have this quote in here. Uncertainty. Some things are always wrong. Even if our intention is good, some things are wrong. We can have a good intention, but the act could still be wrong. It could still not be in accordance with God's plan of love for the human person. So in 1945, someone in Europe wrote these words. In these three decades, Love and loyalty for my people alone have guided me in all my thoughts, actions, and life. They gave me the power to make the most difficult decisions which have ever confronted mortal man. 
So those are pretty powerful words. I mean, first of all, I'd say this guy was an egomaniac. I had the most difficult decisions that ever confronted mortal man. But there's actually much more of a problem than just that. So if you listen to him, it sounds like all he had in mind was the good of his people, right? Love and loyalty for my people. It guided all my thoughts and all my actions. Everything that I did was just out of love for my people and loyalty to my people. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Sounds like his intentions were great. He wrote those words about two days before he committed suicide in a bunker in Berlin. It's from Adolf Hitler's diary. And I know that's kind of a, a shocking example, but, but I bring it out just to show that some things are always wrong no matter what our intentions are. And what he did was horrible, horrific, and yet he thought, he convinced himself, this is actually a good thing. Yeah. Some things are always wrong no matter what the intention is. And this brings us to a point which I think is also important, and you're going to hear this a lot, I'm sure, which is judge not. Have you ever heard that before? Judge not? Yeah, okay. So judge not. Jesus says in the, in the gospel, judge not lest ye be judged. I think it's important to know what he meant and what he didn't mean by that. What he meant was what we're talking about before, that we're not called to be God's executioners. We're not called to judge other people's souls. We can't. You know, we have a list of canonized saints, thousands and thousands of canonized saints. You know, the church has never said that anybody is in hell. We know that hell's real, and it's possible to go there, and none of us wants to go there. But the church has never said, this person is in hell. We don't have a list of the condemned, because we just don't know. That's up to God. It's only up to God. Bishop Fulton Sheen used to say that the the biggest surprise in heaven, he said, is that I might be there. <laughs> so, heaven's a gift. It's not like something that any of us deserve. So that's what Jesus means. He means don't, don't judge the state of somebody else's soul, because we can't. We absolutely can't do that. But he's not saying don't judge some actions as right and wrong, because he's doing that all over the place in the gospel. If you look at the gospel, with the Pharisees, with the woman caught in adultery, he's so gentle and so merciful. But he also says, go now and sin no more. He's calling her to a new freedom. So he's not saying don't judge actions as being right or wrong. What he is saying is don't try to judge the state of somebody else's soul. Let's not think that we're holier, that we're better, that somehow we're called to be God's, God's hatchet people. Does that make sense? Okay. Then the next outcome is the tyranny of popular opinion. Something is good because a lot of people say that it's good. Something is bad because a lot of people say it's bad. But if we just go back to our example of Nazi Germany, we realize that that's actually not a good criterion for judging or deciding anything because Hitler was democratically elected in Germany. And many of the most enlightened, intelligent, refined, cultured people in Germany supported the Nazis. So just because something is popular doesn't mean that it's good. But this is an outcome of relativism. So it's okay, well, most people seem to be going in this direction. That's probably the right way to go. Then another outcome is just chaos. Chaos in society and chaos in our personal lives. And this is because with relativism, the river has no banks. This is an image from Blessed John Henry Newman. He said that the teaching of the church is like the banks of a river. And he said, if the river's banks are strong and high, the river can go, it can move with passion, with purpose, with, with direction. But what happens if you knock the banks of a river down? It becomes a swamp, and it starts to stagnate, and it's not going anywhere. So moral relativism is really this attempt to knock the banks of a river down. Knowledge relativism is the attempt to knock the banks of the river down. That creates chaos, creates this swamp. And that leads to what I would call Catholicism on fumes, which is kind of like, well, you know, I'm kind of Catholic, go to church on Sundays sometimes because that's what my parents did, but I really don't. It doesn't mean much to me. That's the culture that we're all living in, and we're all affected by it, too. So I'd say that would be the last outcome of this relativism. Now, what does God say about this? This is so important. What does God say? First of all, he says, be holy. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is Jesus. 
and the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he's calling us to be holy, to come to him, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And this is beautiful, too, because it's a reminder that truth is not some idea. It's not like something we write in a piece of paper. Truth is actually a relationship. Truth is a relationship with the living God in Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. So be holy. Second, be loving. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Three, be courageous. This is cool because I prepared this I don't know, maybe a month ago, and this is the first reading in Mass today from Ephesians chapter 3. Be courageous. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations. Amen. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. So he's inviting us to be courageous. And I think this is especially important as we remember our calling to be apostles in our families, with our friends, and the world around us, because this is our vocation. This is our calling. And so God's going to give us all the grace that we need to do this. And that's the source of so much courage, because we can wonder, you know, what if somebody says this to me? What if somebody has this question? Or what if I experience this? I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Christ is with us. He's not going to let us down. His power is working within us. Even if we don't have the perfect thing to say, it doesn't matter. He's going to work through us as, as a channel. But hopefully, from these series of talks, we will have some things to be able to say, too. Then be confident. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who we preached among you, this is from St. Paul, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. So here are some resources that I have found very helpful when trying to understand more about relativism or explain it to people. The two, probably the two easiest, are uh, Christophanic, or Stephanic, who's he's kind of like a Christopher West, very engaging, he's really good for for younger people, but he's very good at explaining relativism here. So we'll send all these out to you as well. But I just wanted to put them up here quickly. He's got a great talk, a thirteen minute talk on the internet, on YouTube, about this. And then he has a great little book called Absolute Relativism. It's more like a pamphlet. It's like 40 pages long. Really easy to read. But it's a great explanation of what we talked about. This book is actually going to come up again and again because it relates to all the different topics we're going to look at. Made This Way, How to Prepare Kids to Face Today's Tough Moral Issues. It's a very practical look at this. And then, if you want to understand more about the philosophy behind relativism. This is a little, little more abstract, a little more philosophical. But Peter Kreeft has a great book called The Refutation of Moral Relativism. He's a professor at Boston College and has a great way of explaining philosophy in a very accessible manner. So a refutation of moral relativism. Mary, Queen of Apostles, pray for us. All right, so that's pretty much what I had. You notice I didn't get too practical in this talk. We're going to have later talks about the tough issues, the hot button issues. I wanted to do in this talk that was just to try to prepare a foundation to understand how the world got to be the way it is today. And then a few things that we can actually say about moral relativism. So we'll have time for questions, but first, can we just take a couple minutes, Stephanie? I wanted to ask everybody just to think about some of those questions that we sent out beforehand to prepare the soil. So one would be, just take a minute or two and just think, now, how would I explain relativism in my own words? Just take a couple of minutes if you want to write it down or just think about it. How would I explain relativism in my own words? <laughs> 